So I don't know if you all were here last week, but that's fine if you if you weren't. This is um, the second of three classes uh, that we're doing during the three weeks before Tisha B'Av on this topic, all you need is love. And the reason I wanted to focus on the topic of love during this time is that there's a very well-known statement in the uh, in the Gemara that the second temple uh, was destroyed because of sinat chinam, baseless hatred, uh, something all Jews sort of understand intuitively. I mean, you've all been active members of multiple various synagogues in your life. You know what Sinat Chinam looks like. You've lived in Jewish communities. You know what Sinat Chinam looks like. Um, at, at the same time, Rav Cook has this famous statement where he says, if Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred, destroyed the second temple, uh, the, the temple will ultimately be rebuilt through Ahavat Chinam, uh, unconditional love. Uh, and uh, that was sort of in the, uh, looming in the background for me as I was developing these, these classes was what does unconditional love really mean? Uh, is it something possible? For Rav Cook, it's redemptive, which means it's incredibly powerful and transformative, but is it, is it really something real that we can experience in our, in our own lives? Um, the first uh, session, we looked at the mitzvah of Ehaf Lerecha Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and we looked a lot at Sigmund Freud and his writings, and particularly for Freud, being the astute uh, student of human nature, he recognizes that most love, most of what we consider to be love is often narcissistic. It's, it's primarily selfishly oriented. Uh, we love people who are like us and we love the people who benefit us. And our love to a large extent is often an extension of loving, loving ourselves. And he means that somewhat as a critique, but also as a realistic perspective on what it means to be, to be human. And, and we explore the possibility that love can go beyond that, that we can love an other, a different person who is, who is totally different from us and in a way that doesn't benefit us, but actually might even be uh, contradictory to our own self-interest, but that there can be love like that. We looked at the example of Yonatan and, and David, uh, which the Mishnah says their love is a not that their love is basically unconditional. Uh, at the end, we look briefly at this uh, statements by Franz Rosenzweig, the great Jew German Jewish philosopher, about his understanding of kamocha, that you should love your neighbors yourself. And one of the fundamental things Rosenzweig emphasizes, and this goes to this idea that love does not need to be always narcissistic. What he emphasizes is that when the Torah says you shall love your neighbor as yourself or like yourself, right? That what that really means is that your neighbor is like you, but your neighbor is not you. At the end of the day, your neighbor is different. People are all different from each other. And the challenge is to love them, not because they're like you, um, but because they're also fundamentally, fundamentally different from you. And that idea of, of, of difference is, becomes a very, very important idea for Rosenzweig, particularly as it relates to love, that we can engage in a relationship with things that are similar to us and that may be part of the attraction, but it's the, it's the differences that ultimately uh, bind, us, uh, bind us to them. And what we're gonna look at today is a somewhat of a debate, more implicit than explicit, between Franz Rosenzweig and, and Martin Buber, two German Jewish philosophers who had a very close relationship with each, with each other about the nature of translation. Um, because what Ruffran Rosenzweig understood is that the way we relate to texts isn't so different from the way we relate to people. And the way we try to make sense of texts isn't so different from the way we try to make sense of people. Um, and there can be an ethical orientation that we take towards texts that can say a lot about what our ethical orientation should be towards human beings, again, to love them with their differences and not trying to erase the, the differences uh, that exist between, between us and them. So let me, um, let me share the, uh, the screen real quick. And I'll give you just a, a brief introduction to uh, Franz Rosenzweig. One of the interesting things I think that's occurred to me is when I lived outside of Israel and I was in Cleveland, I was only studying um, like religious Zionist thinkers, and I still very much appreciate them, and I've, I've continued to like study and write on them. But now that I've been in Israel, I find myself drawn at times to thinkers who are not necessarily Zionists, thinkers that are sort of living the, uh, the tension of what it means to be a Jew outside of Israel. So it's just sort of sometimes, you know, from, as much as we love things that are like us, sometimes we're also drawn to things that like, you know, again, push us in ways that are, are different and unusual. So Franz Rosenzweig, if, if, you, if you don't know him, he, like I said, famous German Jewish philosopher. Uh, he's born in 1886. Uh, he dies young at 1929 because he's diagnosed with ALS at a, uh, at a relatively young age. Um, and he spends almost the last 10 years of his life uh, in, a, in a state of paralysis. 
uh, because that's obviously what ALS does. But in his relatively short life, he was incredibly productive as a thinker, as a writer. Uh, and um, he's born initially into what we would call a reform or an assimilated uh, Jewish family in Germany. He's already clearly brilliant from a young age. Uh, he initially studies in university uh, to be a doctor, like any good Jewish boy. He, he, he does it because his mom wants him to. I mean, he's pretty clear about that. And at a certain point, he says, I don't really want to be a doctor. I want to study philosophy. I want to study history and sort of confronts his parents about it. And then he ends up switching to basically philosophy of, uh, of history. He does his doctorate on that. And Hegel's thought of the, uh, of the nation state. Um, and he uh, completes it. And again, he's basically considered to be a, a brilliant young scholar. And you know, really the sky's the limit for him in academia about what he's going to be able to, to accomplish. And already from a young age, even though he's in a relatively assimilated family, he's very interested in, in religious questions and issues and ideas. And even though his family wasn't so observantly Jewish, to be a Jew in Germany at that time, that you still had a pretty strong Jewish identity. Your family was Jewish. It, the Germans weren't going to let you forget that you were Jewish. So you had a very strong Jewishness to you. And like I said, in addition to that, he was always attracted to Jewish ideas from religious ideas from when, when he was young. Um, and one of the interesting things that happens to him in his, in his mid-20s is that he decides that he wants to convert to Christianity. And the reason for this is that that's really what his friends are doing. He's part of this intellectual group of young, brilliant academics who are Jewish, and they start making the decision that they want to convert to Christianity, partially for religious reasons, but also in no small part because there was a sense that if you want to fully be German, right, you have to be Christian, right? In a sense, you could understand Rosenzweig's desire to convert as being sort of similar to like a religious Jew who just doesn't want to be religious anymore. It's not like, oh, I hate Judaism. It's like, well, Christianity is kind of close to Judaism and you know, I have like religious inclinations and this is my way to like actualize my full, you know, German identity. Uh, but what happens is he makes this decision that he's going to convert in, in June of, um, of 1913. He decides that he wants to have one last high holidays as a Jew. And he basically goes to worship in a, uh, in a uh, Orthodox synagogue in Berlin. And after that experience, he says, no, 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 I, I want to stay Jewish. And it's not, it's not an easy decision for him because all his friends were like so excited he was going to convert. So when he makes the decision not to, it's, it's actually a very hard and complicated decision for him, but he does. Um, and he goes on to become this profound Jewish thinker. He serves in World War I, and he writes his great, great philosophical work, The Star of Redemption, towards the end of uh, World War I and afterwards. Uh, and uh, basically, he starts becoming religious. He becomes part of a wave of German Jews who are turning back to tradition. I mean, we could call it like a, a Baal Tshuva movement to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, that's essentially what he does. He starts becoming religious. He starts identifying with the Orthodox community, Orthodox observance, slowly over time. Um, and that becomes his world. And he becomes deeply con concerned for Jewish issues, Jewish questions. And most significantly, he founds the Lair House in Frankfurt, which is the first really major adult Jewish learning center of its kind, in which the whole goal is to take Jews who really didn't know much about Judaism at all, and give them the chance to have first-hand exposure to Jewish texts. Um, not just lectures, and that's part of it, but to give them the chance to actually learn Torah, like sit down and struggle through to understand Torah. And that was a big deal because there simply weren't anything even remotely like that. And it was part of Rosenzweig's religious vision of bringing German Jews back to, uh, uh, back to, uh, to Judaism. And so that's the background. And Rosenzweig's thought is very profound, especially in the Star of Redemption, which we're not gonna go into so much today. Uh, but we're going to look at, in particular, is his approach to translation, because uh, much of Rosenzweig's efforts after he writes The Star of Redemption uh, are, becomes dedicated to translation, uh, translating classical Jewish texts so that they could become accessible to German uh, Jews uh, who could not understand Hebrew. He translates Birkat Amazon. He translates a collection of poems by uh, Yehuda Halevi, the great medieval Jewish uh, poet and philosopher. And then he and Martin Buber together go on to translate the, uh, the Humash and the Tanakh. That becomes the, their big, big uh, project. Um, and, and, and basically, again, what Rosenzweig understands uh, is that translation is really, like we say, translation is interpretation, right? Like translation is how you learn. And so when he's doing these translations projects, it's, it's really, we should think about it as teaching, right? He's trying to take Torah 
and teach it to an audience that, again, has never really been able to access it or even really feel that it is truly a sacred text whose voice resounds in their in people's own lives. So the first text I want us to look at is not about directly about translation, but it touches upon uh, ideas that are directly related to Rosenzweig's philosophy of, of translation. And this is a piece from Rosenzweig's journal. I know this little thing is obscuring it. He wrote this journal piece entry in when he was 20 years old. Um, Rosenzweig's personal letters and journals were published and they're truly brilliant and profound and they supplement a lot of his more public uh, published writings. Um, Rosenzweig is also somewhat of a psychoanalytic thinker. He, he really understands people in a deep way. He understands what makes people tick and he understands that human beings are far more than their you know, rationalism, right? That there's parts of us that we can't really understand and that compel us in all sorts of ways. And, 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 and Rosenzweig very much under, you know, gets that. So here, here's how he opens the journal entry. And this is really a statement about relationships. And I'll point out the obvious that in part, what he's reflecting on is his own relationships. But again, he, he expresses this as a more general statement. So he opens by saying, uh, any relationship between two people that lacks modesty strikes me as immoral. It shows a lack of mutual respect and in a certain sense of self-respect. What should be right by rights be freely given is demanded in a tactless way. So we have to understand what is he talking about here? He opens with a very strong statement that a relationship which lacks modesty is immoral. Now, I would argue this is actually a bit surprising because there are many things that could make a relationship immoral, right? An abuse of power from one side over the other, perhaps a lack of reciprocity between the two sides of a relationship. But modesty wouldn't necessarily be at the top of my list. In fact, I would actually make, you could make the opposite argument that a relationship, at least a close and intimate relationship, shouldn't be overly modest. Our closest friends and family are supposed to be the people who we can be completely open with and then with us. So what could possibly be so immoral about a relationship uh, that lacks modesty, so to speak. So he also goes on to say that a lack of modesty means a lack of respect, self-respect and mutual respect, which should be freely given as demanded in a, in a tactless way. So what exactly does he mean by this? So I think what he means is that even though we're supposed to feel that we can be open in our closest relationships, that doesn't mean that there must be an expectation at all times that we will share our innermost thoughts and feelings with others. That ex expectation often exists in our closest relationships, that there's like nothing that prevents me or holds back my relationship with my wife or, or my children. Like everything's you know, on the table, so to speak. But when this expectation is there, Rosenzweig is saying it actually does damage to, to the relationship. When another person demands an intimacy and closeness with us that we don't wanna give up, it puts a real strain on us. And even if the expectations aren't articulated openly, even if they're not telling us, you know, tell me your innermost thoughts, I wanna know everything that's going around, you know, going on with you. Um, even if they don't say that, they often manifest in, in, in another important way as well. And that's that in our closest relationships with our, with our family and our friends, they often think that they know us completely. And we often think that we know them completely. There's no surprises, right? Like I know my wife, I've lived with her. My wife, I've known her for 20 years. Like there's nothing she could do that would surprise me. I know everything about her, right? My parents might feel the same way about me. I might feel the same way about my parents or my siblings, right? It, it's a thing that often creeps its way in, in, into relationships. Um, and if you think you know somebody completely, it means, like I said, you know who they are and how they're gonna act, how they should act pretty much at all times. And even if we or our family members don't verbalize it, this, this sense can often make us feel trapped and resentful uh, because it means the people we love cannot recognize that we are so much more than the often narrow ways in which they conceive of us, right? That we have these sort of, we put people in boxes, especially close intimate relationships, and we don't let them out of it. Um, and that can really be corrosive to relationships is what Rosenzweig is saying. And again, he's speaking in part from his own experiences. He goes on to say most family relationships are of this nature, especially alas, those between parents and children. It, it is the same almost invariably in married life. This is the cause of the well-known stagnation and philistinism of the relationship. 
right? So what he's saying here is that our, our most intimate relationships with our parents and our spouses often lack modesty because we and they demand to know more than we or they are ultimately comfortable sharing. Um, and what happens is, is that our loved ones refuse to recognize, like I said, that we're so much more than the narrow box that they want to put us in. Now, what Rosenzweig is describing here is a classic psychoanalytic idea, which is that we often feel ambivalence towards those we are closest to. We love them, but there are elements of the relationship that are hard for us, um, and there's just nothing we seem to do about can do about that. Now, with family, you know, we love them and we may feel ambivalent about them at times, but hopefully we stay connected to them. Even, even though Rosenzweig points out, it can be corrosive, right? It can, can turn married life into um, like a cage, right? Like for both parties, right? Because everybody sort of like just imposes their, their sense on the other. Um, but what happens in friendships is it's particularly problematic because at least with family, you often feel you have an obligation to stay connected to them. Um, but friendships, that obligation isn't so often there. So what Rosenzweig adds, he says, friendship can degenerate this way. And when it does, it's ripe for separation. And since there are no external bonds, the separation will commonly take place. Meaning when you reach a point with your intimate friendships where you feel ambivalence about them, that usually is an excuse to then kind of push away or to drift away. Uh, because it's like, why do I need to put up with this? Um, and that happens all the time. We've all had friendships like this in our life where we make a deep connection with someone and we feel incredibly close to them. But over time, they start acting in ways that bother us. Maybe they don't call us as much as they're supposed to, or they don't invite us over for Shabbat dinner enough. Maybe we feel that they can be rude at times or insensitive to our feelings. Eventually, our negative feelings start to, to build up and we find ourselves subtly distancing from our friends. And maybe we don't call as much, maybe we don't reach out. And before we know it, we're simply you know, no longer friends with them. All right, so, so this is the problem Rosenzweig is, again, is identifying in our most intimate relationships. So how do we address all this? And the, and the answer for Rosenzweig goes back to what he says before, right? We need modesty, sniut uh, in Hebrew. Uh, and what we need, Rosenzweig says, is a sort of intellectual modesty. He says, what operates here is an intellectual modesty. That's, that's what you need to have in relationships to make sure that they can be moral, which being more sublime than the physical must be uh, treated with, with greater tact. So we have to understand what intellectual modesty means and, and, and what that might have to do or be similar to physical modesty, or what does it mean in the context of a relationship? So, so let's just think about physical modesty for a moment. We're, you know, we're Jews, we sort of have a context for that, sniut, right? Sniut in the Jewish sense, in the most literal Jewish sense in, in terms of Jewish practice, means that there are parts of our bodies that we do not reveal to the, to the whole wide world, right? We cover them up, not because there's anything wrong with these parts of our bodies, but because they're not something to be shared with all people at all times. Sniut does not mean, as we all know, that we wear a burqa and we like hide our whole body. That's not what sniut means. A woman can dress modestly and obviously still be very attractive. But what sniut means, again, in the physical sense, is that there are things about a person that are hidden and should remain hidden and unknowable. That's what clothes do. They prevent us from knowing what's underneath them. And, and the same, Rosenzweig is saying, should be true in our closest relationships. This is the idea of intellectual modesty. There are things about us and others that in a sense must always remain hidden and private. And the attempt to reveal them or to pry them out of the other person will ultimately only, only do damage. Sneud in the context of relationships is actually, I would say much harder than physical sneud because with physical sneud, you can address the challenge by just buying the right wardrobe, right? And you just pick the clothes out and, 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 and you put them on. But intellectual sneud is, is an orientation that we make towards another person. And that means we have to like work to sustain it at all times. It's, it's a willingness to recognize that the people we love will always have parts of themselves um, that we cannot fully understand or appreciate. And this is really hard because it means that in my relationship, let's say with my wife or my children, there's always going to be something about them that's both hidden and, and even often frustrating to, to, to a, a, a little bit or even more. Something about them that doesn't quite fit right, that we don't understand, that doesn't make sense, some part of them that eludes our grasp. And, and psychoanalytic language, they sometimes use this term of too muchness, but there's a too muchness to that person I love that I just don't know what to do with. An aspect of who they are that I said doesn't make sense. There's contradictions. Why are they acting this way? I don't get it. But Sneud for Rosenzweig is all about making a space for those things in the other person. 
not trying to, you know, again, put them in the box where they can, you know, fit a certain shape that, that, that works for us. Um, but again, making sure there's a part of them that we know we're never truly going to understand or have, have control over. And this is, you know, very hard uh, because the truth is that we, you know, you know, we're the same way, meaning we, 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 we want people to be in boxes, even as much as we hate when other people put us into, uh, in, 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 into boxes. But that orientation of Sniut, of, of saying, you know what, there's always going to be a part about the people I love that I don't understand and I can't control, right? It's really, really hard, but it's essential if you don't want to have your most loving, intimate relationships, um, you know, feel like straitjackets at the end of the day. Um, and again, to, to let the people we love be free and act freely, it's like the hardest thing in the world. Because like I said, we all have this tendency to want to sort of, again, force people to compel them to act and think and, and be in our, in our own image. And when they don't, especially when the people we love, it is, uh, is so, so hard. So what does all this have to do with translation? Well, as I said before, the way we relate to texts isn't that different from the way we relate to people. And when you start studying texts for the first time, what you actually start to do when you study Jewish texts, it's, it's not really the way that we think about it. Um, for the beginner who's studying Torah for the first time, it doesn't mean grappling with like big ideas and philosophy and religion. What it means is learning how to translate. That's what Torah study is at its most basic level is reading Hebrew texts and translating word for word. And that's not just like, um, like beginners, even the greatest like scholars. I mean, I, I know people who are truly brilliant. At the end of the day, learning for them is going word by word and trying to translate and understand uh, uh, what it means. Um, because the truth is that, again, even if you are fluent in Hebrew, it doesn't mean you can simply uh, unpack what a, a sentence means from the, from, from the Chumash or what a section from the, uh, uh, the Talmud means, right? You go, have to go word by word, and it's often slow, painstaking work to really try to understand uh, what's going on there, right? We're very far removed historically from the text, from our, from our, from Torah, like from, from the times that it was produced in, especially, you know, Chumash and, and uh, Tanakh and, and, and Gemara, right? These things were given or produced in times that are very, very distant from our own. So it's not easy to understand exactly what they're trying to say and, 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 and what, what they're referring to. And if that's the case, then translation is always hard, especially if we're more distant from the, the text that we're translating. And in fact, Rosenzweig will go on to call translation an impossible task, and we'll, we'll try to understand what he, what he means by that. Um, what we're going to look at are some sections from a essay that Rosenzweig wrote uh, as an introduction to his collection of Yudal Levy's poems. And each poem was translated from the medieval Hebrew uh, into German. And each poem uh, was also given an explanatory essay along with it, which is a very interesting thing. I was saying, I'm sure we'll appreciate this maybe. I was like, at, when I saw this, I was like, oh, why don't more poets do this? I mean, poets write these poems, but they kind of just like throw them out there into the world. And it's like up to interpretation. So Rosenzweig writes these like fascinating essays that are like uh, poetic in their own right, sort of trying to get at what he thinks is some of the deeper ideas in the, uh, in the poem, which I think is very, uh, very interesting uh, uh, approach. So in this introduction to his collection of uh, Yudal Levy's poems, what Rosenzweig goes on a rant about, which I think is very interesting, are the, the translators that he calls free renderers. And these are people who, when they're faced with a foreign text, what they do is they, instead of trying to stay true to the original text, right? instead what they do is make the text as comprehensible as possible to the reader in whatever language they might be reading in. So what does that mean practically? It means they'll take an ancient text or whatever the text is, and they'll totally put it into to modern language. Right? You might have heard of these, like, or seen these modern renditions of, of Shakespeare, where all the archaic language of Shakespeare is sort of taken out, and, and basically it's all translated into a modern idiom. Um, and so free rendering happens all the time, right? But again, what you're doing is you're taking a text, and you're trying to put it in the terms of the reader as much as possible. Right, you move the text to the reader like almost all the way. And in doing so, the original strangeness of the text kind of get, is basically gets lost. And Rosenzweig is really bothered by people who translate this way um, because it goes back to what we said before. Free rendering is an approach to the text that lacks snoot, it lacks modesty because it assumes that the text can always be translated fully into our own terms. And as I said, it, it, what it does is it essentially seeks to erase all those things about the text 
that are strange or difficult or, or weird. But as we all know, it's those things that often really matter that make the text what it is at the end of the day. So if you're erasing them, right, this goes back to what I said last week, you're basically, you know, translating the text into your own image. And what the text becomes is not something that can challenge you and force you to think differently. What the text becomes is just like looking in the mirror, right? Which is not that interesting at the end of the day. It may feel edifying to us, but it's not that interesting religiously. I can, I can promise you that. So here's, um, here's uh, Rosenzweig's rant here um, about free renders. He says, the, the concept of free rendering is so generally accepted today as a standard for measuring the quality of translations that it demands for ones to be examined more closely. He's really bothered that our free rendering has like taken off in his time. And like good translation is to, like, as I said, to make it as close to the reader, the contemporary reader as possible, even if it means, you know, doing great injustice to the, to the original text. Um, uh, the free renderers. They are all too eager to lend a hand to the poor and fortunate original text. There's no getting around the fact that poetry is not quite as comprehensible as prose. Right? Poetry is it, 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 notoriously difficult to translate because we don't know what poetry means half the time. It's playing with language, right? So to translate poetry is, is incredibly challenging. So particularly when you translate poetry, Rosenzweig is saying, because it's not so clear what it means, that's where there's like this profound temptation to just, again, you know, rewrite it in your, in your, in your own image. Um, and again, free renders, what they assume, of course, as he goes on to say, is that evidently the reason that the text is strange or different is it's due to the fact that the poet did not entirely succeed in expressing himself uh, in the same way that the peculiar remoteness from nature of an Egyptian sculpture is due only to the fact that the artist just didn't get the hang of things. Meaning a lot of translators think they know the text better than the author does. Right. They think like, OK, this guy, you know, he, he might be famous, he might be brilliant, but this didn't really make sense. So I'm going to I'm going to fix it for him. And what he's I, I, in, in his time, there was a notion about the Egyptians, that the reason their sculptures had a certain look to them was because um, they didn't like really know how to shape their sculpture to make it as realistic as possible. It's like the reason it, like something looks strange is because they just didn't know what they were doing. Right, so Rosenzweig says that's what free renderers think. Right, again, it's it's a rather like egotistical way of looking at things, but it's it's not you know terribly uncommon. Uh, he says nothing could be easier or more gratifying than to intervene in a corrective fashion uh, and to fill in a few gaps. The fact that things that are strange to us may possibly be so for stylistic reasons is something the free renderer just can't wrap his mind around. Right, the fact that an author would choose to make their text weird or strange on purpose is something the free renderer can't tolerate because like who would do that? It should all be you know, sensible and reasonable. Uh, he concludes, he says his ambition, the free renderer's ambition is to clothe the monuments of the past uh, and of foreign lands and the clothes of today. But one might ask, would the Apollo of Belvedere really gain that much by being clothed in cutaways and a standing collar? Um, now, if you don't know the Apollo of Bel Belvedere, I'll give you the picture. It's a famous, uh, famous Greek sculpture, right? So he's, Rosenzweig is saying is like, what the free renderer does is they see this and they're like, you know what? I can make this look better. I can put a little bow tie on him, right? Like I can like, you know, make it look the way it's supposed to look, right? That's what the free renderer does, right? Again, which is like sort of a remarkably, you know, arrogant way to approach things. They know the text better than the, uh, uh, the original author. And what Rosenzweig is getting at is like, like what he said before about Sneut, right? That it's actually an ethical act to preserve the strangeness of, of the text. Uh, and if one cannot do it with text, if they can't preserve the strangeness of the text, one is going to have a profoundly hard time doing it with human beings. We're going to just, again, want to force people into our, our own image. Um, in another piece from the essay, Rosenzweig makes the exact point that when we translate the words of another human being, our job is to ensure that the unique voice of that person is preserved. Uh, it's so easy and so tempting that when we're put in the position of translating another's words to simply turn them into what we want them uh, to say. Now, for Rosenzweig, the idea of, of translation is so important because it's not just something done by academics. I mean, Shira, I'll, I'll pick on you a little bit. But you're a professional translator. You might think that only academics do translation, philologists, right, professional translators. But Rosenzweig's po whole point here is that if you think that, if you think that's if your translation is only for the professionals, then you're missing something fundamental. Because the truth is, uh, we are all translators. We all are translating all the time, whether we realize it or not. Um, every time we communicate to another person, 
um, what we're engaged in is an act of, of translation. Because every time we hear a person speak, we're put in the position of trying to translate their words and, and try to figure out what they, what they really mean. And for Rosenzweig, translation connects to this other very important idea for him, and that's the idea of dialogue. The dialogue is about saying something to another and an other, another person saying something to us, and that we don't know what we're going to hear, and we're open to the possibility that we're going to be, uh, to be changed by it. Uh, I'm silent when the other person speaks, and I have to listen. I have to really try to listen and, and try to translate their words and understand what they're saying into terms that I can understand. And when they stop talking, I, I have to speak, and they have to, to do the same. And for Rosenzweig, real dialogue is quite hard, and it requires a lot of work because it means recognizing, as we've been saying so far, that you never really know the whole story about the other person. Um, and you can't assume that they just say something and you just understand it, right? There's, what's, is there anything more frustrating than when you want to say something important and someone's like, yeah, 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 I get it, right? Like Rosenzweig's whole point is that's not dialogue. Dialogue is open to the means being open to the possibility that when the other person says, says something, I'm not 100% sure what they really mean. Um, and for Rosenzweig, dialogue means paying as much attention, if not more attention, to what the other person says that doesn't really make sense to us as opposed to what they do say that does make sense. Because that's what they don't, what they say that doesn't make sense, that often is actually far more important than the part that we that we do understand. And uh, this, this point is made by Rosenzweig in an essay that he writes um, later on when he and Buber have, have joined together in their biblical translation, um, where he, again, makes it very explicit that translation is not something we do with text, it's what we do with people as well. He says, translating means serving two masters. Um, it follows that no one can do it, but it, also, but it follows also that it is like er everything that no one can do in theory, uh, everyone's task in practice, right? Translation is impossible because we can never fully translate what another person means. We can't get inside their head. Um, but at the same time, like you have to do it, right? You can't function, you can't really communicate if you're not trying to engage in, in, in translation, right? Everyone must translate, everyone does. When we speak, we translate from our intention into the understanding we expect in the other not moreover some absent and general other, but this particular other whom we see before us and whose eyes as we translate either open or shut. Translation, again, it's, there's a real life person in front of you in dialogue that you're, whose words you're trying to translate. When we hear, we translate the words that sound in our ears into our understanding or more correctly into the language of our mouth. If all speaking is translating, the theoretical impossibility of translating will in the succession of impossible and necessary compromises we ordinarily call life give us the courage of, of modesty, uh, which will, asks of itself, not what is recognized as impossible, but what is given as necessary. And I know Rosenzweig's language is very poetic here, but he's, he, he's reiterating a point that we saw earlier, right? The translation requires modesty because mm, you can only, to try to achieve the impossible is often like, a, 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 like, a, like an arrogant person does that, like I'm gonna do what nobody else has done. Right, so the modesty is recognizing to be successful at translation is to realize that it's not possible, not completely ever possible. And the modesty is what allows you to really listen. Because if you think it's easy to understand what another person's saying, then you don't really have to listen that hard to them. You can just kind of like be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait till they're done talking so you can say what you want to say because you already know what they want to say. Rosenzweig's saying is that when somebody speaks, you have to really listen. Because like a text, there's always things that are strange or different and weird. You know, maybe it's the way they say the words, maybe it's their body language, maybe it's their word choice, maybe it's their affect, right? Like there's so much going on that one has to try to take in knowing that one's never going to fully be able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make sense of, uh, uh, of all of it. Um, and Rosenberg goes on to say here, right? Like don't conceive of dialogue as, you know, again, I say it and the other person completely understands me and they speak and I completely understand them because that's just not the way it works, right? There's always some sort of meeting in the middle and knowing that even as you speak and you try to listen and understand, right? There's always that which you don't, right? And that, that's the challenge here, whether it's text or people, to realize there's always this like sense of, of something that's hidden, something that's beyond, something I don't understand, something that frustrates me, something that angers me. But if I try to erase that in the person or the text, again, it's gonna do damage. It's gonna do profound damage to, 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 to the relationship. Um, true translation must incorporate the otherness of the other, because if not, what you're doing is just making that text or person that you're speaking with into an image of yourself. Like I said, it's, it goes back to the narcissism we discussed last week. Instead of like looking into the face of another person or, or looking into the Torah and, and truly perhaps experiencing something new and different, um, all you're really doing is looking in the mirror. And as we know, if, if you're looking in the Torah and it's really looking in the mirror, 
we have a word for that in Judaism. It's called idolatry, right? The challenge is to make a space for the otherness, the difference, the strangeness, the scariness um, that's there, because that's ultimately, to a certain extent, where Kedusha, where the holiness is going to, uh, to be. It wouldn't be Kedusha, it wouldn't be holy if it was totally comprehensible in human terms, because then it's not holy, it's human, right? It's what pushes us, what makes us uncomfortable, that, uh, that is oftentimes hinting towards that which is uh, you know, truly transcendent. And all of this brings us to, uh, to Martin Buber, um, the other great German Jewish philosopher, uh, who, as I said, was close with Rosenzweig and the two work together. He's about 10 years older than Rosenzweig. He lives much longer. He, he was an important leader of German Jewry. He was at the forefront of Jewish renewal in Germany, which Rosenzweig was a part of too, um, bringing German Jews back to Jewish texts and Jewish spiritual ideas. He was, Buber was very well known for popularizing Hasidic stories and turning to Hasidut as a source of spiritual inspiration. Uh, Buber's not religious. In some ways, he's like anti-religious, but he's he's like that. Uh, he's like the first, you know, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. That's like kind of his whole thing uh, for Buber, his whole, uh, his whole approach. But in a lot of ways, him and Rosenzweig are kindred um, spirits, uh, which is very, they're both very similar, but also very different in ways that I think are fascinating. And it's, I think their relationship Part of the reason it's, I find it so important, because I, I actually don't like Buber a lot, but what Rosenzweig's very close relationship with, with him reminds me is that we can share a lot in common with people and we can feel connected to them, but there can also be real differences, real differences, as there was between Buber and Rosenzweig, um, but we can still be in a deep relationship with them and, and, and that incredible things can, can ultimately come out of that. Uh, Buber leaves Germany in 38 because Hitler's rise to power. He's been a Zionist his whole life. He moves to Israel um, and he goes on to have an important role in Israel culturally. Um, and again, to sort of distinguish between Buber and Rosenzweig, it's, it's a bad analogy, but Buber is kind of like the Hasidic Rebbe, the secular Hasidic Rebbe. Um, like again, spiritual but not religious. Rosenzweig is a bit more like the, the Misnagid, like the Lithuanian Talmud scholar. Even though he's also very spiritual and, and, and philosophical, Rosenzweig's very sharp. He's very sharp and critical in really interesting ways, where Buber is sort of like, you know, I don't want to say it's hold hands and kubaya, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more touchy-feely, a little bit more, you know, we can sort of, you know, come together. Um, but again, the fact that these opposite personalities were able to, uh, to, to, to have such a vibrant and important relationship is very significant. Uh, Buber is the one who speaks at Rosenzweig's funeral. It's a small funeral. Buber is the only one who um, uh, speaks. That's how close they are. Even though Rosenzweig offers, we're not gonna get, really get into it now, some incredibly sharp critiques of Buber. In my opinion, Rosenzweig basically shows why Buber's thought isn't so helpful, but he still was incredibly, you know, incredibly close with them. So, why is Buber so interesting? Because Buber also does a lot of translation. Remember I said he's popularizing Hasidic stories? So he's translating Hasidic stories uh, into German uh, for a contemporary German audience. And he is, for lack of a better expression, one of those free renderers that Rosenzweig could not stand. Because what Buber does is he takes Hasidic texts and he makes them German in every sense of the word. He makes them what he wants them to be. And he does this by basically cutting out everything that is strange or different or weird uh, about them. Buber really doesn't have any interest in literal translation at all. Um, again, he's all about uh, free rendering. He's all about approaching a text without sneut and basically remaking it uh, in his own image. And you'll even see here in Buber's language, there's like, I don't know if he thinks he's being arrogant, but when I read this, it, it, it's hard to read it as anything other than, than arrogant. So these are two citations from, um, uh, some of his earlier, some of his writings about his relationship to Hasidic stories. And uh, here's what he says. The first is from an essay uh, from a collection of stories, My Way to Hasidism. He says, I have found the true faithfulness more adequately than the direct disciples. I received and completed the task, a later messenger in a foreign realm. And, and what he's saying here is he's like, I went back into Hasidic stories and Hasidic texts and where the students messed it up, I am the one who's recovering their true message. I am the one who is taking the true spiritual message of the Baal Shem Tov that was sort of lost to history or corrupted by the students or became you know, more about religious observance than it should have been. And I am recovering it and reclaiming it and bringing it to its true form. All right? again, that's like a pretty audacious thing to say. And he says something very similar in his foreword to a collection of tales of Rabbi Nachman um, as well. And he says, my recreation of the tales of Rabbi Nachman 
first appeared in print 50 years ago, I have not translated these tales, but retold them with full freedom, yet out of this spirit, which is present to me. Meaning he's like saying, I'm not translating them, I'm retelling them, but again, he's translating them. He's taking the Hebrew ones and just playing with them. And we're gonna see that in, in, in a moment. Um, uh, so he is doing translation, but as he said, he's translating it the way he wants, not, not in a way that's loyal to the text. He says, the tales have been preserved to us for us in the notes of a disciple, notes that have obviously been deformed and distorted, the original narrative beyond measure, uh, meaning the versions that we have are bad because the students messed it up. As they lie before us, they appear confused, verbose, and ignoble in form. I mean, there's all these things about these stories that are strange and weird and they don't make sense. And Buber says, I have been at pains to preserve unchanged all the elements of the fables that convinced me through their power and colorfulness that they are part of the original. So Buber says, you know what? Like we said before, I know these stories better than the students do. I know what's original and authentic and the parts that are, are, are supplemental and corrupted. And I can like, you know, cut all the bad stuff out and reclaim the good stuff. And that's gonna be what the authentic, you know, translation of the story is. And so he, this is this is Buber's um, you know uh, approach here, right? Buber's job is to get rid of all the parts he doesn't like um, that don't make sense, that are strange, so that he can reach the true spiritual meaning of the text. Now the problem with this approach again should be obvious. If you if you make a text speak purely on your own terms, is there really anything ever to be gained from 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 engaging it? Like why read a text at all? Uh, if, you, if you're just going to do it this way. I mean, this is like, you know, Rosenzweig said, it's like putting a bow tie on the Belvedere, Apollo of Belvedere. Like you're just, you're making it into your own little game. Like what's really going on here? Is this what Torah is supposed to, uh, to be? So I, I want to give you an example of, of, of a story where Buber did this because it shows you how he just cuts out the parts he doesn't like. And what's fascinating is we have the versions of the stories he was translating from. So it's not like it from, in this case, they were Hebrew stories. It's not like we can't just easily go tell where things got, you know, got changed. Um, and in fact, the irony, I, I always feel this is weird. Buber translated into German. So we have the English translations of his German that were translated from the Hebrew. So it's like this whole chain of translations that we're actually, uh, that we're actually um, uh, uh, working with. Um, hold on. So uh, here's the uh, 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 story. Um, uh, this is a story of Rabbi Mordechai of, of Neskish. I'm not even sure exactly how to pronounce his last name. Um, part of the reason I'm choosing this story is because R Rosenzweig himself actually thinks the story is significant. Did he tell his Buber that he thinks it's, uh, it's significant? So here's the story of Rabbi Mordechai of, Nes of Neskish. And it's a story about basically how, what, was, what started him on his journey of becoming a, a Hasidic Rebbe. So here's the story. It says, before Rabbi Mordechai of Neskish had recognized his vocation, before he really thought he was going to be a Rebbe, he ran a small business. Uh, and after every trip, um, this is, by the way, Buber's version of the story. We'll see Buber's version and then the original. After every trip he took to sell his wares, he set aside a little money to buy himself an etrog for, the, for Sukkot. Um, so he's, he's a merchant, he's making money, he's saving to buy his etrog. When he managed to collect a few ruples in this way, he drove to the city. And on the way there... Uh, thought only of whether it would, he'd be able to buy the finest of the etrogim that were for sale, right? In your Eastern Europe, it's hard to get an etrog. Getting an etrog was going to be expensive and he wants to get the best etrog possible. So he's saving up a ton of money for this. Like this is like his whole year is like dedicated to this moment when he can buy, you know, the perfect etrog. Suddenly when he's on the way to the city, he saw a water vendor standing in the middle of the road um, and lamenting his horse, uh, which had collapsed meaning the, the Mordechai comes across this guy whose basically horse just died in the middle of the road. So what does Mordechai do? He, he gets out of his carriage and he decides to give the man all the money he had uh, to buy himself another horse, right? This money that had been saved for the etrog, the, the thing he'd been hoping for all year long, right? All of his spiritual avodo is going to go into this etrog. And at the last moment, he comes across this poor man who desperately needs the money and Rabbi Mordechai just gives up all of the money to him. And Buber goes on and he says, this is the Rabbi Mordechai talking. What does it matter? Uh, Rabbi Mordechai said to himself as he turned to go back home. He's going back home. He doesn't have an etrog, he doesn't have any money. Everybody will say the blessing over the etrog and I shall say mine over the horse. Uh, but when he reached his house, he found a beautiful etrog, which friends in the meantime had brought him as a gift. Now, uh, the meaning of the story for Buber uh, again, Buber does not like religious observance so much. Like Buber thinks that what matters is ethics and, and like spiritual connection and ideas like that. So for Buber, what he likes about the story is that what the rabbi comes to the conclusion to is that I don't really need that etrog. 
right? It's not so important because when everybody in shul is blessing on their lulav and etrog, it's okay because I did this profound ethical act. That's what really matters. It's as if I can make the bracha on the horse, right? Because I've done the mitzvah. Like I've done it the way, I've reached the level that it's supposed to be, right? That's the, um, the message that the, uh, the Rebbe, uh, you know, takes away from this. And the story ends positively that when he comes home, you know, he finds there's an etrog there uh, waiting for him. That, that detail's actually in the original, the, the end part. Um, but I want to switch to the original version of the story. Not major differences, but small that are, that are significant. So first off, the, uh, the story opens, a lot of Hasidic stories open with a attribution of how do we know where the story came from? There's often a, tra a chain of transmission and Buber hates that. All of his stories cut out the chain, chain of transmission because who like wants to read about the chain of transmission and where this, this one heard it from that one or heard it from that one. Buber doesn't like that because he feels it's like a distraction. It's one of those things that are strange and weird. Why do we need that in the story? Um, he also always cuts out the, um, the titles and approbations, meaning uh, uh, Rebbe's Sadiqim always are given all these you know, great adjectives to them. Uh, Buber cuts that out as well, too, presumably because he wants them to be as relatable as possible. If, if Rabbi Mordechai is more relatable than Rabbi Mordechai, the great Sadiq and righteous Rebbe of so-and-so, like, you know, he, cuts all of, he cuts all of that out uh, as well. Um, so all the attribution, all the uh, all the the titles, all that goes because again, it's like we're to a modern German reader, they're going to see those details and it's be like, what's going on here? I don't get this. This doesn't relate to me. So he gets rid of it. But the interesting difference um, is the uh, um, is the, the 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 line that the Rebbe says to himself. Right? He gives the money. He knows he's not going to have an etrog. And here's what the original story says. It says, and he said, what's the difference? An etrog is a mitzvah of God and this is a mitzvah of God, all right? So the first point that I think is significant about this line is where Buber is kind of wanting to, wanting to say that the ethics transcend the mitzvah, like it kind of replaces the mitzvah. Here, it's not saying that ethics transcend the mitzvah. It's like they're both a mitzvah. They're, they're just, you know, different mitzvot. And there are certain times when certain mitzvot take priority. And I'm the here is the one where tzedakah takes priority, so that's what I do. So it's not about one, you know, uh, taking over the other, it's that there's, I have to weigh them and I have to make a decision. So that's significant. But then the second part is even more significant because that line where the Rebbe said, oh, everybody will bless on their Lulav and Etrog and I'll bless on my horse. The original version of the story has that, but it's not meant as like some profound spiritual statement. Like, oh, you know, thing, you know, uh, my tefillot are going to be even more spiritual with more kavana because I have in mind that person that I helped and that's the real mitzvah. That's not what the original story is. What the original story is, is that the Rebbe says this is a joke, right? I heard it said orally. This is again, the chain of attribution is re re report, recording this, that the Rebbe said this as a way of a joke. Um, the entire world will bless on their etrog and I will bless on the, on, on the horse. Now, if it's being said as like a joke, as an ironic statement, it's not a moment of spiritual triumphalism it's a moment of like contradiction and weirdness and strangeness. Like it's the Rebbe's pointing out, like this makes no sense. Like I, I gave my money because I wanted to help this person, but like, I can't like, I still, I'm gonna go home. I can't perform the mitzvah. I'm like not gonna have this mitzvah I've been waiting for the whole year to do in, the, in this elevated spiritual uh, manner. So when we make a joke about something, it's often because we find the situation uncomfortable, right? Something doesn't make sense. It's weird, it's strange. There's a contradiction and we're trying to name it. Right? It's not a moment, like I said, of spiritual uplift. It's a moment of this is like just weird. It doesn't make sense. And I'm just going to acknowledge that. And I, I think I did what I was right. And that's just the way it is. So that's not the world, the Buber, religious world that Buber wants to live in, where there's jokes and contradictions and weirdness and irony and strangeness. He wants to, like I said, put a bow on it and make it all sound spiritually you know, uplifting and, and, and inspiring. Um, and that's, I, you know, goes against everything that Rosenzweig thinks about the way translation is supposed to work. Translation is supposed to keep the strangeness uh, and the weirdness uh, and, and, and all of that. And um, what's interesting is when the two end up working together to translate the, uh, the, the Tanakh, the Bible, um, Buber kind of comes to Rosenzweig, meaning Buber accepts Rosenzweig's approach that when the parts of the Torah that don't make sense, the word choice, the phrases, instead of trying to just make them make sense in our terms, he agrees with Rosenzweig that we have to sort of keep the strangeness and the weirdness there. What Rosenzweig wanted to do is that when a German Jew reads the Torah in German, it's going to feel not like comfortable to them, but also kind of weird at times and strange. Because this is a text that came from God, right? This is a holy text. This is a text that God's voice can be heard in. And if it sounds like, you know, nice, you know, uh, you know, early 20th century German, it's, it, and it resonates nicely with the German ear, 
then like how could that be a sacred text a revelatory text right if unless it's we can preserve that strangeness that weirdness that otherness which is really it's it's holiness right how can there ever be a, an encounter with the transcendent uh when the uh when the german jew uh, approaches the the Torah. What they'll get is like if it's if it's the way Buber wanted it. What they'll get is like uh, German folk tales, essentially as Torah. Uh, Rosenzweig's approach: This is Torah. This can you know this 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 is divine revelation in one form or another, right? To read it is to encounter God. It means it's going to be strange and weird, and we have to. It's going to make us uncomfortable. It's going to challenge us, and we can't get rid of that in any way uh, 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 whatsoever. Um, and this really takes us to um, um, the last point. That I uh, that I want to um, uh, that I want to make, um, and uh, to sort of tie this all all together. So um, in this this essay about the translation of the Yudal Levi poems, uh, Rosenzweig makes a, a again a fundamental point about what translation is supposed to look like. Uh, he, and what he notices here is interesting. He says anyone who says something who has something to say will say it in a new way. You will become a creator of language. The language after he speaks will have a different face uh, than it did before. Now, what I think Rosenzweig is getting at here when he talks about um, uh, 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 say something in a new way, creator of language, what he's saying is that not all communication is really dialogue, right? There are times where communication is just about transmitting information, right? I just need to convey something that I need the other person to, to understand. So for example, if I go to the store to buy groceries, most, if not all, of the communication that I'll do there is purely functional, right? It, it, it's not, it's just to try to convey things as clearly and straightforwardly as possible. I go to the, you know, the attendant and I say, I'm looking for this, where can I find this? Or I go, I, I take an item off the shelf and I ask the attendants, right? How much does this cost, right? This is not an interaction that necessarily blends itself as being open to, uh, you know, all sorts of translation. It's just about communicating as, you know, basic information. But, but for Rosenzweig, dialogue is different. Dialogue is about sitting with somebody, looking at them in the eye, and having about a conversation about something that really, really matters at the end of the day. It's about a real encounter with a text or another human being. And the reason we encounter them in the first place is because we believe they have something truly significant to say to us, right? You don't have a dialogue with somebody that you already know everything they have to say. You have a dialogue with somebody that you need to learn from, that there's things about them that you don't understand, right? That are mysterious and weird and difficult and strange and that you're, you know, you're in conflict with them, right? Dialogue, again, is about those things that we find uncomfortable, those things that don't fit naturally or nicely into the box that we want to put them in. Um, and when we engage in dialogue, it means opening ourselves up to the possibility that there's something new here something that's gonna to touch us, that's gonna impact us. Meaning you cannot enter into a dialogue if the assumption is you are going to be unchanged by the experience. That is not a dialogue, it's, it's a conversation. A dialogue means for Rosenzweig, this is very important, that when the other person speaks, I'm open to the possibility it could change my entire life because I assume there's something new there that, that needs to be said, something I don't understand and have not fully experienced before. And that's not an easy orientation to make, uh, but that is what dialogue, dialogue, and, and what a real, a real encounter with another is 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 really all about. Um, so when Rosenzweig says this about language becoming new, creator of speech, right? Like that's a dialogue. That's when somebody has something to say, and or we believe something. Somebody has something that's that we really need to be to be open to. And in that context, when we have to, you know, again, still translate the other. Here's what Rosenzweig says: This is the translator in this context makes himself into a speech organ of a foreign voice. Now in the Hebrew, I don't know German, but in the Hebrew translation of this, it says the translator makes himself into a shofar for the, the foreign voice, which I like, right? Because like a shofar is like, you know, it transmits the, the sound, right? So, and again, the sound of a shofar is not, um, not necessarily a pleasant or a comfortable and easy sound. It's a strange, it's a weird, it is, it's a discomforting sound. So the job of the translator is to channel that weirdness, that strangeness, that otherness um, towards us in the conversation. To not again to get to get rid of it, but to to preserve it, uh, because as R uh, Rosenzweig says here, um, that strangeness, that otherness, which is really for Rosenzweig a form of revelation from the other, um, is what the other makes audible over the chasm of space or, or of time. Right, that's what really hits us, and it hits us hard. When this foreign voice has something to say then the language has to look different afterward than it did before. Revelation, the revelatory experience of another, um, it, it changes the language itself. 
because the otherness just kind of like pushes on through. Uh, this success is the criterion for the dutifully executed accomplishments of the translator. Um, that the, uh, that again, when you've done translation right, it means you've made yourself a shofar for the strangeness, the otherness, and really for it's like the Kedusha, the holiness of the text or, or of, the, uh, of the other person. Um, that's the challenge, again, with translation or with relationships, that we have to hold on to the strangeness, the foreignness, and the otherness in the text or the person that is speaking. Uh, and if we do this, if we make a space for the otherness, um, it will make an impact on us. And it, it always leaves a, a mark on us. Um, this is most apparent in our most, again, loving, intimate relationships. What ultimately changes us the most in the encounters with, with those we love is not the aspects of them that we understand, right? The people that we love, the things about them that truly change us is not the parts of them that we, that we understand and, and know entirely, that we like, um, or the parts of them that are like us, right? What ultimately changes us about our encounter with the ones we love um, it's the part of them that isn't like us. Uh, and that's what makes the relationship so compelling, right? That's why Sneud is so important to Rosenzweig in our relationships. Because if you don't make a space for the your person that you love to be different, um, even if you don't understand, even if they don't understand why they're different, but just if you don't make a space for that, right? You, you're never gonna have that real dialogue that, that changes you. Um, the temptation is always uh, for a relationship to lack Sneud. Just like the temptation for the translator is to always just render that text as, you know, in, in the way that you understand it, in the way that's most comfortable to you, that makes sense. Uh, to do the free rendering of the other, such that, as I said, they only look like us. We put that bow tie in the Apollo of Belvedere, uh, so to speak. Uh, but as Rosenzweig said, and we saw this last week, right, regarding the mitzvah of Yehavtarecha Kamocha, uh, loving your neighbor of yourself, what that really means is you love your neighbor uh, because they're like you, um, but they're not you. Uh, because again, people are like us, but they're never us entirely. Uh, and the way in which we maintain that love with others is through an act of translation um, that can preserve the, the differences uh, within them. Um, and it, that's what makes love real, right? Like otherwise, again, we put that other person in a box and it's like just staring in the mirror. But if we want love to be real and we want love to change us and we want love to be that redemptive love that Rav Cook talked about, then we you know, have to give them the freedom to be different, even when that's painful, because it, it will inevitably be painful and frustrating at some point. Um, but that's the part of them that makes them holy, and it's the part of them that you know, transforms us uh, as well.